No Welcome doubt. everyone. I'm here with Kieran Rose, who is one of my absolute favorite autistic bloggers. Um, his bio or his uh his yeah, his bio is probably like three pages long of all of the great work that he's done. But I'm gonna highlight a few things for those of you who may not be familiar with Kieran. Uh, he's the creator of The Autistic Advocate, and that's on Facebook as well as he has his own webpage. Um, he's also an international keynote speaker. Maybe we'll get him here in Virginia Beach one day. No, that would be amazing. Um, and then he's the co-founder and chair of The Autistic Cooperative. And I wrote notes down. You guys know I write notes. Um, and that's an international network for autistic-led advocacy organizations who want to change the negative narrative of autism and neurodivergence. So that includes probably ASAN, yeah. um, the ICANN network maybe. Um, yeah, we have, we have members of the ICANN network in there, yeah. So that's really awesome. So that's a whole network of, internet. it's an international network for, uh, for those agencies. And then he's also the executive board member of SLP Neurodiversity Collective, which is something that I've been following very closely um, because most of y'all know I have a non-speaking son and uh, he uses an AAC device. So I've been following them really closely. I love the work that they're doing. And so what SLP Neurodiversity Collective is, it's a US-based international nonprofit lobbying organization. So it provides education about relationship-based non-trauma-inducing therapy practices, which are which is respectful of human rights. So basically it's therapists teaching therapists how to do therapy that is respectful, non-trauma-inducing, positive therapy. And they also do a lot of, um, of work educating parents and teachers if you haven't liked them on Facebook, go like them. It's SLP Neurodiversity Collective, and their website is growing and growing and growing with lots of resources. And that's a resource that if you have an SLP at school, at your kid's school, you should um, give them that resource. Kind of write it down, hand them a sheet, and so that they can check out that resource as well. Did I miss anything? <laughs> Uh, no, I think that was enough. <laughs> We've been here all day, like you said. I know. I, I, I said I was going to cherry pick the ones that I mm -hmm. want to talk about. All right. So what we're going to do is I want to talk to Kieran uh, about his latest article, and it's called Asperger Syndrome, What's in a Name? And he talks about the Asperger's diagnosis that was introduced to, I think, the DSM in 1993, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. Um, and it's already gone from the DSM and it's on its way out from the ICD as well. Yeah. And he talks about, um, he goes into the history of Asperger in the article. He goes into the history with, uh, Connor, uh, Lorna wing. He talks about the controversy of whether, uh, Asperger was a Nazi. Was he not a Nazi sympathizer? And then he says, like, none of that matters. And that none of those things are the problem with the Asperger's diagnosis. So can you tell me uh, or tell us what what are your issues with Asperger's diagnosis? <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> um, yeah, that's the thing, because I um, what actually sparked it off. I get asked the question all the time because you know, people with an Asperger's diagnosis, often they go on social media and they get jumped on for calling themselves Aspies or, you know, saying I have Asperger's or whatever. And um, so I get asked all the time, why is this happening to me? What's what? What's the problem? What's going on? And I've had the privilege of kind of floating around the autistic community for the, like, the last 10, 20 years. So, you know, I've seen the evolution of kind of things. And um, basically the issue is that the Asperger's diagnosis was born out of need, but it was unnecessary need. Um, because at the time, um, back in back in the kind of early 80s, Lorna Wing, who was a psychologist and researcher over here, um, she was commissioned to go, and uh, people that have read Steve's book will know this bit, she was commissioned to go and find autistic children in a certain area of London. Um, and she did, but they weren't autistic children that could be diagnosed under the cr criteria that existed then. So there was lots of work put in. Could we expand the criteria? Could we open it up and make it broader? And and it didn't happen. They wouldn't. They were very you know protective of what autism was back then. 
So it took a few years, but she met with Uta Thrift, who was a German researcher living in London, who had translated Asperger's work. Um, so she, Lorna Wing and Judith Gold, came up with a concept of Asperger's syndrome based on part of Hans Asperger's work, a small part of Hans Asperger's work. Um, she came up with, uh, with the spectrum. Is the that spectrum right? as well, yeah, which again was based on part of what Hans Asperger kind of, kind of came up with himself. Um, basically the idea that, you know, there are lots of different people that present in lots of different ways. Um, so that's where the diagnosis came from. But the only clinical difference between Asperger's and autism is the ability to speak at the right time, in inverted commas. Um, that's it. So if you had, I don't know, um, an eight-year-old child who was given an Asperger's diagnosis, that meant that, that meant that they could speak or they spoke early. But then if you had someone who had been given an autism diagnosis, who then could speak fully by the age of eight, there's no difference between the two children, but they have a completely different label. And wrapped around that, because of the kind of so social and cultural understanding of intelligence and, you know, based on IQ tests, which is just all a load of guff and rubbish um, and racist at heart as well in, in its terms of its history, um, there's an association with if you are verbal and able to speak, then you, you're you intelligent. If you are unable to speak, you are unintelligent. So that's where, you know, that's where it comes into functioning labels and things like that. But that's basically where Asperger's became socially a functioning label. Um, so if someone was given Asperger's diagnosis, it's assumed that they don't have any other needs. They don't have, you know, they don't need supported. They're absolutely fine. They're able to function. They're able to go out and do this, whatever, whatever everybody else can do. Um, it often means that co-occurring conditions weren't explored because, you know, Asperger's was an umbrella term as autism was an umbrella term. And it, it's, but obviously people who had an Asperger's diagnosis did not all able to go out into society and, in society right. and function fully. So, you know, so it created an expectation on people that actually shouldn't have existed. Um, and also what happened there as well. Sorry, sorry. Is that why the DSM took Asperger's out and created yeah. more of like a, not a functioning level, but a need for a, a levels of support instead. Is that why? Yeah. That? Yeah, effectively. I mean, there was lots, there's been lots of lobbying for a lot of years about removing it and folding everything into one thing, because the problem is with the spectrum is that when it was created, when Lorna Wing kind of envisualized it and how it became understood culturally and socially was this kind of linear straight line where you were at a fixed point where your diagnosis is starting with low functioning or severe autism PDD, NOS, and Kana's autism in the middle and classic autism, and then Asperger's and high functioning autism at the other end, which in reality just does not work because, you know, like everybody, we have we, we feel differently with every day. We face different challenges, you know, sometimes we burn out, sometimes we're flying and we move around this space all the time. So you can't have a linear line. So yeah, so that's why it was all kind of folded in under one thing. And I still don't really agree with the number levels and things because it's still functioning levels to a degree. But, you know, obviously, in, their, in in medicalized terms, they feel that there's a need for this differentiation. So that's kind of the best, least worst thing that they could kind of come up with. And it, doesn't, but, um, it doesn't even go into things like you talk about, like apraxia, um, yeah. co-occurring conditions that most doctors, if you have apraxia of speech, they'll just say, oh, well, that's just part of the autism diagnosis. Autism. when. Yeah. It's not. It's a standalone condition. You don't right. even have to be autistic to be a, have apraxia of speech. Right. So you know, it's a, it, it's this is the problem. This is the whole problem with the autism narrative, and this is essentially the point that I kind of got to with, with that article. And it's stuff I talk about all the time. Is that there are so many things that go into being autistic, but there's only one real fundamental thing that anybody needs to know is that it's neurology. It's the process, it's, you know, all of us exist in a world that is brimming with sensory information and that's how we move through the world by processing it. We take it in, we process that information and then we have output, we react to it. Um, and for autistic people, <laughs> we tend not to have the filters that non-autistic people, this is very simplistic, obviously, right. but we have less filters. So we're taking in and cognitively processing more information than non-autistic people, which means that we're working harder to do so. And then when you add in all these co-occurring conditions, it causes a whole world of problems all over the place. But lots of those co-occurring conditions are actually things that can be supported. Mm -hmm. But because it's all lumped under the umbrella of autism, autism is an umbrella term, 
those things are never investigated they're never supported and then it just becomes oh that's just part of autism like yeah. thing, even things like depression and stuff like that it's now <clears throat> in the uk at least there's no adult support for autistics who are depressed because it's assumed that depression is part of being autistic right. which is ridiculous right absolutely ridiculous but that's that's how it stands and all these labels that's kind of how it's that that's that's kind of where we've it's driven us to um so that's that's why i'm uh you know people who have that asperger's diagnosis you know for a lot of them for for me at the time when i was diagnosed that was my diagnostic label um it it's answers to questions you know you have all these questions you don't understand what's going on and then someone gives you a word which answers those questions but if that word then has been created and used in a way which is divisive, which it was, then it causes a whole world of problems. And because, you know, it's a good thing for me that the label is going. But obviously, people, if people want to keep hold of that identity, that's absolutely fine and valid. But this is an answer as to why they're getting jumped on effectively. Thank you for that. I mean, so it's basically what you're saying is they're in the article and, and now what you're saying is basically it's an arbitrary line between Asperger's and autism. And mm -hmm. that line is speaking on time yeah. or not speaking on time. Yeah. And that's it. And yeah. that's the only difference. But it kind of had a multiplier effect mm -hmm. in our social understanding about autism that yeah. I mean, it's not, it was never written, but those with Asperger's or that had the Asperger's diagnosis were somehow smarter and didn't yeah. need the help. Yeah. That and that's, that, that's kind of that then what that did was that, that was a kind of social understanding of it. But because of the way the world works, that social understanding then re-permeated it back into professional understanding as well. So then professionals engage with that narrative as well and then reinforce it when people come for diagnosis or support. And that's that's kind of how it's a vicious, vicious circle that just keeps going round and round. Let me see. Somebody said all those co-occurring labels and diagnoses is what led me to my autism diagnosis, that and my son getting diagnosed first. I'm glad that you were able to get that get that diagnosis. I can't see who it is, um, but I'm glad that you were able to get that diagnosis. And those were kind of clues to lead you to your autism yeah. diagnosis. Congratulations on getting that. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> so yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, and those of you who are tuning in, you can always comment with a question and uh, we'll, we'll get to it. I do have my own specific questions, but you know, this is, this is our book club meeting. So if you have a question, we can get to that as well. Um, so the next question I want to ask you is about the neurodiversity movement. Okay. Um, I'm in a lot of groups because autism is something that I just want to know everything about. I want to hear all of the perspectives. I have uh, two autistic children with, I mean, a whole entire spectrum of, of different needs, you know, so I'm, I'm looking at different pages, maybe that that uh, gear that lean towards more severe uh, mm -hmm. autism. And that's what the pages are called, severe yeah. autism, which we know is not the right term to use. But um, so people with, with kids that have high support needs, maybe, they, um, maybe they're not speaking, maybe they need AAC devices, maybe they, um, you know, they're adults who uh, have continence issues. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those people. So they kind of are, they're kind of pushing back on the neurodiversity movement saying that, that it excludes people with high support needs, uh, that it, that the neurodiversity movement claims that autism is not a disability. Um, and that they fear that the, that the neurodiversity movement will take away whatever little tiny bit of support people do have for their mm -hmm. kids. And, um, and for themselves, actually, I'm not going to say for themselves because these are parent groups that I'm in. These are not autistic led groups yeah. that I'm in. Um, but that they fear that this movement and the people behind it are basically excluding those with, um, with high support needs and that, that it might lead to policy makers taking away those supports. What, can you tell us what the neurodiversity movement is? 
<laughs> yeah, well, it's it's kind of it's based on the neurodiversity paradigm, which is basically um, the understanding that the term neuro neurodiversity basically means that everybody, all humans, you know, we're all slightly different. We all think in slightly different ways depending on our upbringing and our, you know, all the different things that shape our identities. Um, so that's that's what neurodiversity means. Within that, there are pockets of neurodivergence. So it's people whose neurology is very, very similar to each other, but very different from the wider group. Um, so that's people who are autistic, people who are ADHD, people who are bipolar, people who are schizophrenic, all of those kind of different things. And there's no positivity or negativity attached to any of that. It, it's just a thing uh, which exists and which describes the world that we kind of live in. But lots of people kind of jump on that and say, because you know, because you're separating into these different groups and things, and you're 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 putting different measures in and things like that, that it, it, it's actually encouraging um, people pushing for kind of let's look at all the wonderful positive things and let's wrap it all in a shiny bow kind of thing and, and ignore all the negative. Some people do do that. Some absolutely. I mean, you think it's it's a movement that involves millions of people right. to a degree. So everybody's going to have a very outline. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you're always going to have people who kind of think slightly differently about where they want to go and how they want things to be shaped. But within the core of that, there is a, a kind of large fundamental group of people that hopefully are driving it, including myself, that are hopefully driving it in the right way, that absolutely see autism as a disability. Um, but it's a really complicated thing because the question that's always asked is, 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 is being autistic, is it a disability, yes or no? But it's not a yes or no answer. It's too binary for that. There's this whole gray area in the middle because there are aspects of being autistic that if the right things are put in place, the right reasonable adjustments and accommodations are made, then you can fly, absolutely fly. But the flip side of that is there are always going to be aspects of being autistic, which are disabling, um, especially around kind of sensory issues and things like that. Um, because, you know, for all the will in the world, nobody's going to, I can wear sunglasses all day long, but nobody's ever going to turn the sun down. You know, so, so it's kind of hugely loud noises. I can wear ear defenders, but I can't stop there being noise in the world. Right. Those kind of things that go on. Um, so I can put things in place to help me with that, but I'm still going to be disabled because of those things. You know, and I have sensory issues that are massively disabling for me that nobody can ever do anything about. And, um, but all of that is wrapped up in the fact that this is who, this is what makes me who I am. And this is where you get into the kind of identity aspect of autism. Um, the people who kind of, the parents of, of, children or adults that are that are deemed severely autistic again it comes back to that conversation about co-occurring conditions because again those are the things that are never explored um it's massively oh, look at andy smith hi andy um those those are the things that are never explored things like learning disabilities are just shoved under that autism umbrella um physical issues like apraxia motor issues and stuff like that is all lumped under that autism umbrella when in actual fact, it all needs to be really, really carefully picked apart mm -hmm. and broken down into what can we do about this? What can we do about this? What can we do about this? You can't really do anything about neurology unless you want to start doing gene editing, which hopefully they won't do. Um, certain organizations are pushing in that direction, but we won't talk about those right now. But other things can be supported and helped. And that's what the neurodiversity movement is really about. Yes, it's looking at positivity, but it's not it's looking from a strengths based focus mm -hmm. rather than looking at someone and saying, these are all their deficits. What can we do to fix them? It's looking at actually, this is a person, this is an individual human being with as many strengths as they have deficits. So let's focus on the strengths and let's support what you would term as the deficits. And then you reframe your whole thinking about how you help that person. I think, um, um, thank you for that explanation. It, it took me a long time to understand just what the neurodiversity movement was trying to say. And it's it's not saying, you know, you see those memes all the time, autism isn't a disability, it's a different ability. And, and I, while I understand the sentiment behind those. I do, mm. I think that I used to use them. You know, I, mm. used, to, I used to post things like that as well. <clears throat> but the thing is, is that being disabled, this is what it has meant to me, is that yes, autism is a disability, and that being disabled is okay. And it's yeah. not a bad thing. Yeah. So I think that we, and I really want to do, I want to do a, a thing on, on ableism and learning about, you know, what, 
what we have ingrained inside of us that we use the word disabled and ooh, that's bad, but it's not. Yeah. You know, being disabled is just what you are, and that's fine. Autism is a disability. My kids are disabled. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And we need to support whatever it is that they need supporting in. So if if someone is to grow up and all they can do is play on the beach all day. Let's yeah. say that they can't hold a job and they, you know, can't do the things that society has deemed important and they can just play on the beach all day. That's okay. Yeah. And we should play on the beach with them. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of what it's, that's kind of what I've learned and it's taken a lot of soul searching actually. I mean, just to say that, Oh, okay. So this is, this is an okay thing. And it's not, it, I think I'm getting tongue tied now, but we put, we put good and bad onto things and that we don't need to do that. No, not at all. To support them. And yes, neurodiversity movement says, yes, whatever those things that those autistic people need to be supported in, they need those supports. And yes, yeah. we should fully fund them. Yes. We, you know, we should fully fund IDEA. We should fully fund, uh, whatever, uh, access to AAC devices, access to, you know, whatever these, whatever the people need. Exactly. That's, that's, that's it. It's, 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 at its heart, the neurodiversity movement is about everybody, everybody on the planet getting what they need in order to thrive. That's, that's Ooh, pretty like much that. it. I like that. Okay. We have a long one. It's going to cut us off. Okay. <laughs> had to get up taller. I was so conscious of that social narrative when my son was first diagnosed and how keen others around me were to gain reassurance by asking me the question, it's more like Asperger's though, right? A more mild autism. I was met with such confusion when I said there was no such thing. Yeah, I mean, that is that is the narrative. I'm gonna take yeah. this, this comment off so that we can see each other, but um, yeah, that that is the narrative is that that linear line when it, yeah. It's not that. No, right. it's not. It's kind of, if you want to, I envisage the spectrum as a kind of four dimensional kind of thing mm -hmm. with everything moved like a, some, some researchers now in the UK are using words like constellation rather than spectrum, I because if you can, if you can imagine like a whole universe around you where things are constantly moving and orbiting each other. And that's, that's a kind of better explanation for, and it's everybody. We all have spiky profiles. We're all, we all have different strengths and perceived weaknesses at different times as well. Some, you know, some days I can, I can sit here now and talk to you and be really really eloquent and then i will go home and shut after this i will go home and shut down and probably be mute for two or three hours so and and that's the thing and it's that's not just an autistic thing that's an everybody thing everybody gets drawn out of and and he's better at doing things at different times and different times in their lives and different times of the day and there's so many different factors that play into it but amongst the autism world and i think this is a thing that's driven by academia and research everything's driven into these like binary narrow boxes you're either one thing or the other and then you can't deviate from being that one thing or the other it's just a, a constant compartmentalizing of things there's a um there's that car did you see the cartoon i can't remember who does it there's like a comic strip about explaining the spectrum as um more of like a circle with plots in it if anybody mm. knows of that link i'll put the link up afterwards but it really helps me understand how autism is not linear from severe yeah. to mild to mm -hmm. whatever it is. It's more of, yeah, like a scatter plot. Yeah. If anybody has that link, you can put it up. Um, if not, I can put it up later. Uh, let's see. Taking away all those co co concurrent <laughs> conditions. I'm not a great reader. <laughs> uh, Taking away all those concurrent conditions what does autism, what does, what is autism really? What defines what a person as autistic that are not concurrent conditions? Okay. Oh, so if we take it all away, what? What's left? What, yeah. What is left? Yeah. So um, if you think of your brain, where is your brain? 
No, your brain is not just in your head. Your brain is in your whole body. Your brain is from your head to your toes, from fingertip to fingertip, because your brain is also your nervous system as well. Your nervous system is part of your brain. So that's your neuro that's your neurology. Your neurology is the process, like I mentioned earlier, your neurology is the process of taking in all the information that you need in order to be able to live, processing it, and then reacting accordingly to that. So what autism is, is a neurology that is not typical it takes in more information and the upper brain actively cognitively processes that information consciously or more of it consciously anyway so not having those filters means that your brain's having to work harder there was um, a study done in sweden about 10 years ago on uh, measuring brain waves of autistic children against non-autistic children those autistic children, whilst they were sleeping, their brain their, their brains effectively were working 30 to 50% harder than the non-autistic children. And that's why they were asleep. So they're still processing all of this sensory information that's going on around them, you know? So it's kind of, so being, yeah, so being autistic, based, autistic means having a different neurology that works in a specific way, which is different from other neurology. So that's effectively there. But what obviously that does is if you are taking in more information and having to think harder about it, then that's going to slow down your ability to process information. It's going to slow down your reaction to things. So it might mean that you need longer to understand what someone's saying and actively work out what they're saying and then react to that also and then you can understand them why there are social issues and communication issues and and then if you think you're working harder but you're living in a world which is hurrying you up constantly and bombarding you with all this information then you are going to become quite anxious living in that world. So you are then going to show, I mean, you think the autistic, di the autism diagnostic criteria is not a criteria for autism. It's a criteria for extreme anxiety. All those behaviors are in there are all anxious behaviors. Yeah. 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 And that's that's kind of what they're measuring you against. So the reason you will be identified as autistic as a child is because you're anxious. Yeah. You're going through something which is traumatic or you have gone through something which is traumatic and it's caused all these anxious things to happen. Um, but even that, that trauma is really, really subjective, because if you think an autistic person takes all this information in, you imagine what happens to an autistic baby an autistic baby that's literally just come out into the world and is being bombarded by all this sensory information more than a non-autistic baby, then they're being traumatized from the moment they're born. So they're having to react accordingly to that. They're becoming more anxious accordingly to that. So, and then as they're growing up, they're having to fit in and conform and do all these different things. So then that's when levels of trauma and trauma and trauma and trauma is of like all these different micro traumas applied. And that's why so many autistic people have got CPTSD. Um, because it's just a constant living in a non-autistic world is a constant application of trauma. Oh, Andy Smith just found the link there for the Thank you, Andy. Uh-huh. So yeah, so I mean that was a that was a really long answer to a simple question, but it, it's kind of that's where the difference comes in. That's where the difference in um communication social thinking all of those kind of rigid behaviors and re repetitive behaviors it's it's anxiety and it, it's it's all those anxious behaviors that you're having to just kind of make yourself feel better by doing when you were talking about that i was trying to look in um dr Prezant's uh uniquely human we're reading mm. that now and he talks about the diagnosis criteria in uh in his in one of the first chapters and it and it says that Oh, it's, it talks about the the circular reasoning around around how they diagnose autism, and which is only behaviors. But he talks about that they should be adding the inability to regulate what you know the input that is coming in, and yeah. they have a hard time regulating all of that. Especially, I mean, you it's understandable that if you yeah. are processing it so much differently then you would have a hard time, you know, regulating all of that regulating yourself. And the older you get, especially when you are undiagnosed, even when you're just diagnosed, really, if you're not supported in the right way, the older you get, the harder it is for you to be able to regulate. You get worse at regulating kind of thing. And it's, I mean, we'll talk about masking and burnout in a minute, but it, it's kind of, that's where that aspect, that's when the inability to mask anymore kind of happens because you just can't do it anymore because physically you get to the point where you just, you just crash. Right. I have a big one again. Um, disability is not a bad thing. And also it is also true that if we as a society were more supportive of alternative means of communication, for instance, 
More autistics would be able to find their place as contributing members of society, not because they don't deserve disability support, but because we need their brilliance as we look at our future. <laughs> like Do you know, that. That, that's, that's reminded me of something. It's, it's not really amusing, but it amused me at the time. Um, somebody was talking about um, a certain American charity and the, the things that they, they, they like to put out. And um, <laughs> well, we that stuff in here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, they, they, were, they were talking about the fact they're, work, they're working with Google at the moment and um, mapping the human genome um, and are funding a lot of that work. And, um, and there's, there's lots of thought around the fact that, you know, it's for gene editing purposes. It's that let's find the genes that, that create autism and let's cut them out or carve them up or whatever um, so that we don't exist anymore. And then somebody said, um, it's really, really interesting because if they do do that, who's going to fix the Internet when it breaks? <laughs> <laughs> when you look around yeah. you this world that we live in much of it again as steve's book says and anecdotally from all these historical figures right. much of the world that we live in the technological advances the 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 writing the art that we have the culture that we have around us has been created at the very least by neurodivergent people if not autistic people and if you take that away, what's left? Just conformity and people in business suits not making any money um, you know so it's the whole and world is like, run by I us. I Twitter yesterday or the day before yesterday, and I uh, I put in the hashtag Ask a Tech, and because I've, I've been doing these videos and uploading them to YouTube, and mm -hmm. my my computer is basically telling me that it's going to shut down and never uh, come on again because you know I have all of this stuff stored on my computer and I've never cleaned it up. So I asked, uh, so I went on to Twitter and put ask a tech, you know, what do I need to do? Cause I don't have time to call or anything. And the person who responded to fix my problem, I looked at his profile. He's autistic. <laughs> he knows what to do. Yeah. yeah. He's going to fix the internet. That's right. <laughs> That's cute. That's cool. This is brilliant. Kieran, I need that quote again. Oh gosh, which, which quote? <laughs> We're going to have to go back through and look it's at it. It's been recorded, is not it? Yes, it is. Uh -huh. Let's see. Excellent description. Thank you very much. You're the man, Kieran. You're the geezer. <laughs> Let's see. By living. So many comments. It seems like the only way autistic people can be successful is starting their own businesses. We have such a hard time keeping employment. And I mean, yeah, I mean, traditional employers, traditional workspaces are just not accommodating. And I think mm -hmm. that that is one thing that one of your organizations tries to help workspace. I don't, I can't remember which one, but one of your organizations tries to help um, employers and workspaces become more um, inclusive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so that, that's kind of one of the things, one of the many things strings to my bow, but it, it's, yeah, it's a difficult one because it's kind of, part of the problem is with this, that we have all these statistics floating around, around employment and anecdotally there's a, there's, there's a lot of autistic people who can't hold down jobs and are unemployed. But the problem is that, firstly, that nobody's tracking prevalence race, rates properly. No one's identifying how many autistic people there are in the world properly. Mm -hmm. So automatically, you've got to assume that the figures are wrong because there's lots of people that aren't included. Um, secondary to that is there are lots of autistic people who are autistic and know that they're autistic. Um but who don't engage with research and questionnaires. I, right. I, I, I engage in very, very little research. I work with, I'm actually right in the middle of writing an article now and um, talking about this, that I work with a limited number of researchers because I know who they are personally. I know what their goals are. I know where the funding has come from. I know what the real world impact of their research is going to be and, and what they aim to do with it as well. Um, but so many autistic people like me don't engage in like common research um and there's so many autistic people that are quite comfortable and happy in the jobs that they do mm -hmm. and you know they they, they whatever they do they're kind of they're, they're usually in a fixed pattern of kind of this is what i do it doesn't change day to day so that's absolutely fine for me i can just put my head down and go for it kind of thing and mm -hmm. 
all those people are missing from those statistics. Right. But yes, there is a significant portion of the autistic community that do struggle to keep jobs. I've been through this myself. I've had unemployment after unemployment after unemployment, mostly related to burnout and actually telling my employers that I'm autistic, which has then changed attitudes around me. Oh, yeah. um, but that's that's the bit that really needs the attention and that's the bit that really really needs changed and neurodiversity has become a huge buzzword in the world of recruitment um and it's being driven in completely the wrong way um it's mostly about techie people um you know i can't use a computer i'm i can i can type on a computer but i wouldn't be able to fix a computer and you know i couldn't build a website or any of those things that's not how i work um, but some autistic people are really, really good at that. And so the business industry is, is making money out of that fact, um, you know, and there are people that are kind of driving that message and they're right. It, it's self-employment is actually a way that I would encourage a lot of autistic people who can't keep jobs mm -hmm. to go. But as long as they've got the right support in place to be self-employed, because it is such a difficult and complicated thing to do. And you're reliant on yourself as well, which is really hard if you haven't got any income. Yeah, and then here in the U.S., you won't have health insurance because yeah. that's something that's a whole nother, it's a whole nother topic, right? Let's see. I don't, um, I think one of one of our, I think our autism society here is having um, an autistic pe a person come speak, and she she calls herself the first law uh, autistic lawyer in in florida and things like that <laughs> I was saying, she's, 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 i bet she's not the first autistic lawyer in florida <laughs> like, like, i wanted to call i wanted to um hit michaela up on the phone and say hey you know you have some you can be a speaker because you're uh -huh. a lawyer you know you pass the bar and you're uh -huh. autistic and you know you could do all of these speaking thing speaking engagements because mm -hmm. you say that you're the first one because yeah. we know that that's not true yeah. No, no. And it, it's it's quite um one of the difficulties I have is that there are autistic people who are very engaged in the community and go out and kind of try their best to platform as many people as possible and and kind of you can't speak for everybody, but you can speak for the general direction that the community wants to go kind of thing. But there are many autistic people, not many, there are significant autistic people who kind of understandably because we spend our whole lives being invalidated and not being listened to that when somebody comes along and says especially autism charities that come along and say oh my god your story is brilliant let's put you out on a stage and we'll give you some money and then oh look here's a script about us that you can read and it becomes really tokenistic right and and that in itself is problematic because it's kind of I do a talk over here. We have um, autistic pride picnics over here. Um, like in the summer, there's, there's just groups of autistic people who come together and people sing songs and give speeches and all sorts of kind of thing. It's just a really positive thing. And um, one of the talks that I did for that last year was about the fact that my story is not important and the story of any individual autistic person isn't important. It only becomes important when you start putting those stories together and collectively the weight of that story is really, really important. Yeah. And that's not to say anybody, you know, you shouldn't dismiss yeah. a single person, right. but because the world, you know, the, 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 the phrase, you know, you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. That's actually now been turned to become a really divisive thing because if you've met one autistic person, that autistic person can't speak for everybody. And all of a sudden they can only speak for themselves. Whereas you get parents who talk for everybody, parents who talk for us. You have professionals who are talking about us all the time, collectively. You know, every aspect of the world can talk about all of us, but the but autistic people, can, can yeah. I, I can only talk about myself. Uh -huh. Yeah. And right. that's that's the situation and that's the that's narrative. Problematic. That we're in. Yeah. That's very problematic. I work with parents of autistic children, getting them to buy into the sensory regulation component component is quite a challenge but a challenge I'm willing to take on to help parents understand their child's needs. Thank you for sharing your insight. That's great. Okay. Here's a big one. We're going to be here. And can you see me? <laughs> can just <speak> over. <laughs> Keeping employment is a problem. As Asperger solved this problem by examining the special interests of his little professors and matching their interests with employment. Michaela became an insurance researcher because she was so good at remembering things, which she often does at home for her company. 
But this is in contrast to the school systems who want to divert the child's attention to be compliant. That's my mom. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, my mom is super smart. Mom, I'm going to take your comment down so that um, so that we can see each other. Yeah. So that's a that is a big issue, especially in America when we have these standardized testings. I'm not sure about other countries, so I can't comment on that. But you know, we talk about strength-based um, education. We talk about strength-based therapy. But then when you get into the school system here, everything is compliance-based. Mm -hmm. Everything is standardized. So yeah. that that means that this person over here and this person over here have to learn the same exact thing, the same, well, exactly the same not way. always the same exact way, but they have to... They have a prescribed set of ways that they have to pick exactly. and choose what works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is, I have been you know as a teacher i already knew that I, I hate standardized testing but as a parent of neurodiverse kids i can see that if you don't have this unicorn teacher that's going to just differentiate no matter what and mm -hmm. figure out the kid and and look at the individual students then your kid is kind of screwed you know yeah. your kid is your kid is in with the herd when your kid does not belong there Absolutely. So they belong with the herd. They don't belong in their learning and, you know, they don't learn the same way. As yeah. The this so, is, um, this is the problem with kind of, I mean, you'll know this, the, the, the kind of inclusion rhetoric that's gone on for about the last 20 years or so. And very, very few people actually understand what inclusion means. They think that it means that everybody has to be in the same room doing the same thing together. Um, when in actual fact, inclusion is kind of, you know, it's having access to the room as and when you need it um, and having equity in order to be able to access as and when you need it as well. And it's which is a very different thing. Inclusion quite often is not being in the room at all or is standing outside the door, peeking in kind of those kind of things. And it's that's really problematic when you're trying to shoehorn everybody through the same system, doing exactly the same things in exactly the same way or in a very limited prescribed set of ways. And it's, it's not funding the support that those, no. those, the, those kids need. I mean, you're not, you're not meeting that. You're not meeting the needs of the child there. You're meeting the needs of the education system. And that's, that's, that's the problem. It's the wrong way around. And, you know, I'm a huge advocate for child-led learning so the child should be at the center of everything the child should be you know maybe maybe you introduce the topic but the child leads on how they understand and 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 find out about that topic and what they do within that topic rather than but it seems to be how the world works especially around autistic children and autistic adults that we are presented with a set of choices we're not able to make our own choices. You know, somebody's already decided where they want us to go. Right. And these are the ways you can get there. When in actual fact, it should be us deciding where we go and how we get there. It's it's just it's just messed up. But it comes back to the whole thing about the the functioning levels and the intelligence or the not intelligence. And because we are generally presumed to be incompetent because we're different and we have deficits according to the professional world. So mm -hmm. so if you, someone's not competent, then you have to make decisions for them. And especially if you don't speak, then you're dead. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get to the other comments. I'll show them as well. But I want to get to because uh, I have two more questions for you, and I don't sure. want to run on all day because I know this is uh, this is a lot. So you had another um, article about autistic burnout, and I read this article. I think you shared this article with me maybe a couple years ago when mm -hmm. I was just kind of learning about uh about autism and about and just about everything and you shared the article with me about autistic burnout and i want you to talk about autistic burnout in relation to what some parent well what almost everyone talks about regression yeah okay and 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 even in relation to the data we're taking on so much data on these kids i mean if you're in speech therapy, if you're in school, if you have an IEP, I mean, we're taking all of this data on these kids and, you know, sometimes they're, you know, moving up, you know, the, the web and flow of our, of our autistic kids, you know, sometimes they're moving up and they're in a great place. And then sometimes they're, sometimes they just regress and drop off a cliff. Right? And so that's what they call it. They're talking about mm -hmm. regressing. Yeah. And I want you to talk about that, all of that. 
Okay. And go. <laughs> uh, and go. Um, well, we touched on it a little bit earlier about um, like when we're talking about neurology and we're talking about taking in all this information about working harder. So if you think, if you imagine it as kind of like a 100 yard dash, um, so an autistic person starts on the start line, but non autistic people are already 50 yards into the 100 yard dash. Um, so they've got a head start and everything. So we're working, but the expectation is always there that we've started in the same place. Um, even though people know that we're not, even though they know that we move through developmental milestones at different rates and at different times and all those things, it's all very different. They don't, they kind of know all that, but screw it all up and chuck it out the window and still have the expectation that we should do what everybody else does. Um, so because we're working harder at doing all of this and because also at the same time we're having to mask, we're having to fit in, um, masking is like a whole different conversation, but this is what leads to burnout kind of thing. It, it's literally um, all the things that you do for an autistic person does to kind of to fit in. So it's running scripts constantly and editing scripts constantly, suppressing sensory you know, uh, reaction to sensory information, negative reactions to sensory information, okay. um, holding yourself. Yeah. yeah holding yourself in physically speaking when you can't speak or forcing yourself through that and um, not regulating meltdowns and on a day-to-day -day basis as that happens you know you know i give the example in that article that i used to come home from work and literally would come in uh, get in at four o'clock would collapse in the heat and would, would, would get up at like nine o'clock at night kind of thing and um, so it would just be unconscious for that whole time so I was not regulating myself properly because I was having to go through that every single day. And it gets to a point where that come, becomes unsustainable. You, your body just can't hack it anymore. And what happens then, you enter into a period of what I term extreme burnout, where it looks like clinical depression. It has the physical representation of clinical depression. It's like you feel like you're moving through treacle. You can't get out of bed. Um, even down to things like your peripheral vision narrows, you dissociate more, all of these kind of different things that you would expect with depression. But there's one significant difference in that you're not sad. You're unhappy because you don't know what's happening to you and you wish that you could get out of it and you become frustrated at that. But you are not clinically depressed. But when professionals are looking at this because you are showing all the physical signs of it and because you're usually you know you're handed your 10 point are you depressed checklist where you you know you can only score things kind of thing and because you are still at that point trying really hard to mask and conform and because there's no other answer to what you're going through you fill in the depression checklist as though you are depressed and you give them the answers they think you think they want to know then you get described antidepressants you get cbt you get th talking therapy if you know if you're lucky enough to get those things and it, it's um and you're being medicated for something that that medication is not going to help with then you reach a point where you start realizing that the medication isn't doing anything for you but you are still going through this process so then you start turning inwardly on yourself and you start thinking well if it's not if if, if the medication isn't working this is me that's the problem this is the issue right. here. And then that's even worse. Exactly. And yeah. you, you kind of, that's the internalized ableism starts coming in and, and all this kind of self-hatred. It does. It's a complete downward spiral. And then you do actually start getting into the realms of clinical depression because you have literally depressed yourself. Um, <laughs> to be, right. It's flippant, but it's effectively kind of what happens. And in amongst all that, because you are, you know, you're worn out, you're physically and emotionally and psychologically worn out your body starts having autoimmune reactions to things. And that's why lots of, I think lots of autistic people have, you know, like physical, we get eczema and all of the kind of the aches and pains that go of everything. And, and, you know, all of those kind of things. And quite often it's stuff that you get investigated for, but nobody can ever find the source of these things. There's no label attached to it, or it's something like, you know, like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, which isn't really a thing. It's caused by stress and all these other things that are going on. And, you know, if you think about, and then in terms of regression, if you are masking furiously and you are able to do the things that other people can do, or at least from the outside perspective, look like you're able to do all those things. Right. And then all of a sudden you hit this period of burnout where you can't do these things anymore and the mask drops off. That's it's going to look like you've scumped, let back three yeah. years in your developmental abilities or, you know, all of a sudden you used to be absolutely cognitively you used to be brilliant. And now all of a sudden cognitively you're not brilliant because you've got you're full of brain fog and all of these different things that start happening from an outside perspective. It looks like what will be termed regression. Now, 
if you think about, you know, I don't want to talk about Andy Wakefield and vaccines and things like that, but if you think about the MMR jab and at the age that the MMR jab happens, it's around the time that an autistic child really starts socializing properly for the first time. So you think you have a child that's, yeah, nursing. yeah. So, yeah. so you have a child that's taken from a safe, very ice, fairly isolated space. You know, they might have friends and family around a lot, but you know, that's pretty much it. And then all of a sudden you dump them in a nursery full of strangers and um, with loads of different sensory information going on and their ability to kind of mask everything that's gone through is now nil, then it's going to look like they've regressed, which is what happens at the same, you know, and then at that point you stick a vaccine vaccination needle in and the reaction happens at the same time. Coincidentally, it well, looks like the vaccine itself to get, yeah. yeah, to get shots. And exactly. So yeah. then it, it, and that, yeah. And the, the shots themselves are traumatic right. and, you know, and lots of people do have a negative reaction to, to, two shots. You know, you can become a little bit right. ill afterwards, yeah. and things, which then allows you, this allows you to mask at your full capacity and all of those different things. So a child going through this without any understanding or an explanation of what's going to happen, it's going to look like someone stuck a needle in them and then they've turned into a severely autistic person which isn't actually the case. There's this, there's this whole context that's missing around it. And this happens through whole periods of life. And now there is research that's gone on in the UK um, that actually identifies autistic masking as a lead into the high suicide rates amongst autistic adults. So it's actually now a proven, not proven, but it's something that's really now being investigated as an indicator of later suicide. Who is and Bernard, investigating? Sorry? Who is doing, who is... Uh, it's a lady called Sarah Cassidy um, at Nottingham University in the UK. Um, if you can't, if if you can't get hold of it, I'll um, I'll get the research for you and send it over to you. Um, and now other people are now doing work off the back of that. And there's there's lots of work in the UK. There's lots of research going on in the UK about masking. And there, there's there's lots of narratives being created which I'm not comfortable with that are kind of you know especially separating autistic women and girls from the rest of the autistic population. Um, there's, there's whole issues around that. We're not going to that now, but it's kind of, there is work happening here, but around burnout, there is n autistic burnout specifically. There is no research. The only piece of research that's happened and it came off the back of me actually writing that article was Aspire, um, which is Dora Raymaker and Christina Nicolaidis. Um, they, uh, they did a qualitative piece of research, which was, which it was actually named after a line from that article. Um, and so they're going to do more work into that. I can send you, they've done some presentations on it, so I can send you the links for those. Yeah. Um, but that's it. There's no other research. This is something the autistic community have been talking around, talking about for like 25 years, and there's no research into any of this. And it's kind of, this is so frustrating, absolutely frustrating, because the research world is constantly behind the autistic community. Right. Um, so they have their uh, own agendas. They yeah, and the, and, the, and the research that happens is very, you know, it's very shaped by narratives and who's funding yeah. it and funding all it. of those things. And so it's like this this constant... That, it's like, of this. Yeah. Say that again. Who is going to make money off of it? Exactly, yeah. 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 Right. And, and at the minute, because there's no tangible way of making money out of autistic burnout and autistic masking... There's no money being pumped into that kind of research. Right. right. It's see. just a mess. You're describing my life in an extreme burnout right now. I'm sorry. Diagnosed at 40 a few months ago. It's so hard to explain to people around me. Thanks for such a great explanation. You know, you talk about that as well. Like, or maybe it may have been Emma that talked about after a person receives their diagnosis, especially as an adult, they go through this period of, I guess, taking the allowing themselves to take the mask off and, and really feeling that burnout. I mean, just really, I mean, it's, it's traumatizing in a way that yes, it's, it's wonderful that you know what's happening, but then you kind of are reliving all of these traumatic things. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it, it's that that period, especially in a late diagnosed adult, it's um, it's a huge issue because usually someone's got to the age of kind of, I don't know, like mid 30s, 40s, even later. I had someone email the other day who was 87 and had just been diagnosed. Um, wow. And this was all I mean, she was she was so uber positive that all these questions have been answered kind of thing after all this time. But, you know, it's kind of um, 
when someone gets that diagnosis at that late stage, it's usually burnout that's led to them getting that diagnosis because there's no other answer. Um, so they start searching for random things that might actually answer those questions. And then they generally stumble across someone who's autistic that's written something and it kind of makes sense. But oh, um, goes off. Yeah. But there's, there's, there's when, when that happens, when that mask comes off, when someone's been masking for so long, there's massive identity issues there as well, because it's literally kind of, People, yeah. I've had people, yeah, yeah, I've had people come to me saying, I can't stop masking because I'm terrified that there's nothing underneath. You know, how painful is that? That they're, they're actually terrified of their true selves and because they don't know how to be any different. And or it, even it how becomes, to find it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it's, it's just awful. I mean, in, in the blog, I mean, for people that are making comments about kind of um, that they're going through it, mm. it's, in the blog, I've got some suggestions of different things that people can do to kind of help them through it. But the biggest, I mean, the biggest things are really uh, kind of limiting your, anything that causes you sensory upset is limiting that as much as possible is reducing the amount of demands on yourself and the amount of demands that other people place on you. And basically withdrawing for a long time and doing what you need to do in order to kind of get through it. Exactly. But the difficulty there is that lots of these people are parents, have jobs, need the money that's coming in, you know, so you just have to kind of pick your way through it. It's, it's really hard for me to say this because I wish I had a tangible answer for everybody, but you have to find your own path through this using as many of the different techniques as possible. And as a parent, if, if you're a parent of a child who's autistic, it's important to to and you said this, and I'm only quoting you. I'm not, I'm not giving my own advice here, but it's important to to look at your child and, and recognize the signs of overstimulation mm -hmm. and maybe come, and maybe when somebody says, oh, well, they're regressing or we took this data on on your child and he's hit a, a regressive or, or maybe that is having bad behavior, defiance. Yep. And and instead looking at what's happening, maybe taking a step back, maybe keeping them home from school or, yeah. or you know, just thinking about your child in terms of that type of overstimulation in regards to that burnout so that those kind of things don't happen, you know, taking yeah. care, taking care of your child. And that's the thing. I mean, I think, I don't know if it's in that article, but I've, I've, it's a line I use quite a lot. If you think um, as an adult, if an adult who has a job as a teacher, social workers, anybody in that kind of the, the helpful kind of services, um, if you are run down and if you are unhappy in your workplace, you can go to your doctors and you can get a medical sign off to say, you know, you're going to be off work for three months or whatever, however long it is that you need. Children are dragged to school, kicking and screaming. Children who are going through exactly the same experience are physically picked up and carried and dragged into places. School is a school is an awful environment. School causes most burnout in most autistic children um, because of the education system and how restrictive and narrow it is because of the sensory overstimulation, because you are in an environment where you are having to mask furiously, where you don't understand the communication that's going on around you. All of these things, of course, that's going to trigger you into a burnout. How could it not? but then you're dragged there and you're dragged there. And then parents who kind of stand up and say, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. Then they get parent blame and all of these kind of processes kick into place. So again, it's a really, really difficult thing to navigate, but you know, I'm, I'm with, with my own, my oldest son, I've got two, I've got three children, two of them are diagnosed. Um, my oldest one in particular, um, he does school, school four and a half days a week. So he has Friday afternoon off. We take him to a dog cafe where he goes and plays with the dogs and helps out serving tables and things like that, you know, because he loved that. So he's just an environment that he loves to be in kind of thing. And it's so there's more edu valuable education in him doing that than there is forcing him to stay in a building that he can't cope in. And all of this is, I mean, I have two older kids who are uh, neurotypical, if that's even a possibility for a teenager to be but I mean I put this in context of of raising them as well I mean we take days off of school like if mm. it's 80 degrees and it's March we take the day off and we go to the beach yeah. because it's not just I mean it's the the school world the world of you know the world of school the world around us is it is overwhelming for everyone yeah. I mean you've got you know, my teenagers who are, you know, they do well in school. They don't really have any sensory issues or social. They get burned out 
And just to think of how burned out my autistic kids are dealing with all of that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's important to take time and and just and just decompress yeah. for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody needs that. And it's yeah. but it takes it takes us back to that kind of what we were talking about at the beginning about the kind of social narrative. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we there is an expectation that we are born. Um that we go to school, that we sit exams at 16, we sit exams at 18, we go to university, we get a good job, we get married, and we have children who turn out to be, who are going to be princes and princesses, and exactly, and then, you know, we have this wonderful doting adulthood, we have grandchildren, and then we die peacefully in our sleep. That's not the real world at all, and it's, but it's what parents never assume that, sorry, people who are not yet parents never think about the fact that they might have disabled children. And the reason they never think about that is because it's not normalized and it's not normalized because disabled people are not wanted. They're not different. They're the people that get pushed out of the herd Reading and therefore, <clears throat> yeah, normalized. They were exactly. not. Yeah. And then, and then on top of that, those disabled people, because those disabled people aren't really wanted because they're broken, their deficits and all of this kind of thing, the, the right things aren't in place to help those disabled people thrive. So you come around on this, this, this loop, constant constant loop going backwards and backwards backwards and forwards on itself and it's just a huge mess and we are the ones that are we as autistic people and disabled people are in the middle of this and then our parents and our families and the people that want the best for us and don't know how to give that because they're not being educated properly are then you know they pay the price as well they pay a secondary price on top of that and it's but people make lots of money out of us as well and that's why the cycle keeps going that's right Kristen. that's funny School loses, haha. -ha. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay, Kieran, I have one more question. Okay. Because we've hit the hour mark. We knew uh -huh. that was gonna happen. <laughs> um, so my final question is if you could give advice to the parents and teachers of newly diagnosed autistic children, mm -hmm. what advice would you give them? Um my advice would be, yeah, I guess more for parents, but this then relates to teachers as well, is that you want your little person to like themselves. You want them to self-accept. You want them to be strong advocates for themselves in whatever way that they can be, and you want the best for them. And the only way that they can do that is that if you use positive language around them, you encourage them to see the best in themselves and you help them understand what's happening in their life. And for lots of autistic children, you know, lots of autistic children aren't told that they're autistic. Firstly, lots of autistic children are told that they're autistic and it's never adequately explained to them what that means for them. Um, and then services around them are kind of trying very, very hard to fit all these children into boxes that they can't fit in and kind of just squishing them in and pushing them down. So, you need to reframe your mindset and you need to think about this as not a problem to be fixed, but as actually something which can be really, really positive if you support it in the right way. And if you shuck off all this social rubbish that we have, that, we're, that we indulge ourselves in all the time, all this fluff and guff, which is really, really pointless and actually put your child at the heart of everything truly. So that would be my big bit of advice. Thank you for that. And one person asked about, um, protecting your child's emotional health and mental health. And I think that everything that you've said in this entire interview, everything that you say in your blog, and it all centers around protecting your emotional health, protecting mm -hmm. uh, your child's emotional health. And I think that that's, that's really the building block for everything. Yeah. And, and if you want your child or if you want to be able to, um, to, to, progress or to have have a good life or, or yeah. whatever whatever goals you have to protect that first because yeah. that's the building block for everything i know that maslow has that pyramid isn't that right yeah the hierarchy of needs uh -huh. food shelter or whatever i would say for especially for autistic people that the bottom of it is emotional health yeah and, and protecting that at all costs it's safety that's 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 where you need to start from a point of safety right oh let's see hey angelina sounds like my little <laughs> oh, 
somebody say great advice. Okay, well, I have kept you very long. And I have really enjoyed our talk. I have too. It's been fantastic. I think that we've learned an awful lot from you. And if you haven't checked out uh, Kieran's blog yet, it's The Autistic Advocate. And he also has a Facebook page that you should follow. And I will put all of the links to the different blogs, his Facebook page, his website, um, in the comments later. And um, Kieran is in the book club, so we're happy to have him here. He says that he doesn't, I mean, I know that he doesn't have time to participate, but he said that he really likes what he sees in the group and he's, um, you know, he's kind of following along. So I think that's amazing. So thank you for that, Kieran. Um, you know, if anybody's got any questions afterwards or anything, if they want to drop them in the comments and then I'll come in and try and answer them as best as I can. But, you know, that just thank you to everybody. It's, I said to you at the start, Megan, that it's, I think this group is such a phenomenal thing and to see so many people learning in such a positive way and learning from different resources as well. And that, that's a, that's a really good, you know, it's not everyone sticking to one book kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. lots of different books and, and introducing lots of different ideas and concepts and because we need to change the way that we think. And the only way that we can do that is by opening our minds to new ideas. And that's what you are driving here. So just thank you for doing this as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let me see. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, it's it's been, the book club has been, I mean, it's taken on a life of its own and it really mm -hmm. has, it really has been more successful than I could have ever imagine. I've learned more in this club than, than I could, than I could dream of. I mean, we just started because, because I needed help in company reading Neurotribes and mm -hmm. we've already gotten through, we're almost to our third book. We're on to our fourth and fifth next and we're, and we're talking to authors and, autistic people next week um when diego comes on uh -huh. diego is non-speaking and he yeah. wrote his book he's an aac user um and i'm working on i'm working so hard on a fancy way so that uh i can include him as much as possible in our meeting we're gonna do the we're gonna pre-record our interview because uh -huh. That's what he requested, and that's he needs the questions first, doesn't he? I guess. And yeah, well, yeah, I did yeah. already send him the questions, but um, we're going to pre-record the interview tomorrow evening, and that way I can kind of edit out. He was he was concerned about pauses and things like that, so uh, I'm going to edit it, and then we're going to view it together. I'm trying to work on a fancy way to really include him when we watch it. Maybe start mm -hmm. a watch party yeah. and have some a fancy screen um, streaming Diego. Uh -huh. as well. So. I'm that would be brilliant. I'm really looking forward to it. And yeah, you know, I've never, I've never spoken to Diego actually, but um, I've spoken to Edlin before. She actually, um, she was very, very kindly. She's uh, actually given me one of the books that I have in my lending library, and um, she sent it over. So, so it's, okay. uh, I'm really grateful to their family and for the work that they're doing as well because it's amazing. Yeah, they're they're actually going. I think they're in the process of getting some signed copies so that we can give them away as well. Uh, Steve Silverman gave away signed copies at the very beginning um Michaela she gave away some signed copies so we love we love doing giveaways in here <laughs> when I eventually write my book <laughs> when I get the time you can have some it's not that one well, you're well on your way here and I mean honestly with the blogs that you do your blogs are really uh, yeah I mean they're really they're really chapters really, yeah, they're they long really chapters. Are. I mean you could do I mean I would love to have your blogs all in one book in a paperback so I can highlight mm -hmm. I need to highlight your blog. I'll yeah. do one just for you. Yeah. <laughs> when you get your book published, we want some signed copies to give of away. Of course. 